who believes that, that not, that's, that that's not true? Well, that's interesting. Okay, well, a couple of people. So, you know who that is? That's Arthur C. Clarke. I did this this morning. This morning. You probably can't see it, um, and I'll read it for you. I'll try to speak up and put the microphone down. Evidently, Clark wrote in 2010, utter nonsense. Half of us come from IBM, and we've been trying to stamp out that story for years. I thought that by now every intelligent person knew that HAL is derived from heuristic algorithmic. These are Arthur C. Clark's words, so it did not come from IBM. This is from the book, by the way. If you haven't seen this and you're remotely interested, uh, it's a very cool, very cool book. The foreword was written by Clark himself. And that's where that page came from. I mentioned Lichtenberg yesterday, the gentleman from Göttingen. Sorry, I didn't put the umlaut on the O yeah. here, but fun to kind of look on the keyboard. Then. So, sorry, it was not on your keyboard. It was on my keyboard. It was not. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tony. I'm sorry. So, in any event, I learned this morning that he's also credited with calling these things Lichtenberg figures. Oh lightning and other branching phenomena, which that's something I learned. This, by the way, the reason I went to Göttingen, this is me standing at the grave of Gauss, which if you're an electrical engineer, you may have a great admiration for Gauss, which I do, so I went there. This was about 10 years ago. Okay, so now I'm finally gonna move on to audio stuff. Any questions so far? Now Richard's here. <laughs> <clears throat> Richard, see now he's talking during the talk. And he didn't hear me either. Well, the microphone up here now. Let's move on. We'll come back to it at the end because he's going to cut me off on time. So here's part of the original uh, talk I've been wanting to give. Again, the HP 48 has this great utility that it's got a timer in it and it's got a piezoelectric transducer, which is sometimes called a bender or buzzer. It's not a very good audio source, but at least it makes sound. My original goal was in testing these four machines just to test different characteristics of their audio or acoustic output. Was it really? That, that's, well, that, that's a good point. I have a 41 and I didn't test that out. Maybe next time. So you've, you've noticed this variability also. Do you have a comment, Ed? Yeah, I think the 50 G is kind of, kind of light on sound. It's not very, it's not very loud. <laughs> I did some measurements, and well, you'll see shortly. So subjectively, I think a lot of you have noticed when the 49 and 50 came out that it was noticeably quieter. And I noticed, and I think some other people have mentioned, that it sounded a little more pure. Now, pure means it's not a nice sinusoidal tone, which I'll talk about shortly, because I did some measurements, and you'll see some actual waveforms here. I did want to talk a little bit about sound, and that's why I'm going to have a demo running up on this PC here in a minute, assuming everything goes right, which I know is being perhaps too hopeful. <clears throat> okay, so this is what I had hoped to do. These three machines, at least at different distance measurements from the machine, since one of my interests was as an alarm clock, it's like how far away from your face do you keep your calculator while you're sleeping? You don't have to answer that. That's kind of um, but I figured about a, me a meter would get us in the ballpark. How absorptive and reflective the surfaces around it can can vary things. As you may not know, most sound that gets to your ear, about 80 to 90 percent of it is reflected. Very little of it is actually from a direct source. So, and I'm not going to get too deep into the theory here. The Fourier series is basically the theory that says that any sound, any signal actually, which includes sound, is composed of a number of sine waves. And if you want to know more, you can look it up or, or talk to me later. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about musical instruments, but then time wouldn't allow. But you may know that the reason different musical instruments sound different, like why does a piano sound like a piano and a clarinet or a bassoon, it's not just 
the, the attack of the sound, but the harmonic content. For instance, the reason I showed these numbers down here, 440, 880, if the basic tone is 440 hertz or cycles per second, which is a middle A on the piano, if you're familiar with that, multiples of the integral multiples of that, be at 880, 1320, are harmonics of that, and we're going to do some audio demonstrations here to, to show that. Wrong button. Let's try this one. So, this didn't show too, too well, but up here is a sine wave, which I'm sure most of you have seen. This is a square wave. This is a sawtooth or ramp wave. What may not be clear is the simplest of all three of those is the sine wave. Any other signal, which would include the square wave and the ramp, can be composed of a number of different sine waves. If you'll give me a second here, I think I'm at the point I want to do a demo of some different signals, so give me just a second. That's coming through, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well done. Is that comfortable? How's that? Yeah. Won't move the mic. That's a sine wave. Jake, you That's a sine wave? That was, well, it, yeah, it's with the quality of the speaker in here sitting next to me. Yes. This is a square wave. Now, as some of you, I, I'm sure, know, a square wave of, say, 440 hertz consists of a 440 hertz sine wave, one-third of the amplitude of a harmonic three times that, so about 1320 hertz, et cetera, et cetera. You can look up these series online if you want to find out more. And then finally, the salt sawtooth or ramp wave. So the square wave assumes 50% two sides. This is a test brought to you by the emergency broadcast. Yes. <laughs> That's an interesting point about the emergency broadcast on the purposely big frequencies that would really be annoying. They're at they're not multiples of each other. They're called non prime or something oh, came up they yeah. came up with it. Dissonant. dissonant yes okay well we'll leave that as it as it is because I'm gonna have the calculators playing shortly in a bit too <clears throat> I didn't play any noise but I assume all of you can detune your FM radio and hear what that sounds like speaking pink versus white noise Pink versus white is just a matter of energy per bandwidth. It's different. Okay. Yeah. And, and by the way, Audacity, which if you haven't heard of it, it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a free audio tool that's quite powerful. It's free, so you know there's pros and cons. But if you look into, in, under Generate, you can generate all these signals very easy. Tell it 440 hertz, tell it white noise, pink noise, and you can fidget with it yourself. It's a very, very fun toy for doing that. So, just briefly, as you may know, the human ear is more sensitive, and this is a sensitivity diagram, and it's, I think it's upside down because lower shows more sensitive. So you can see here that around three kilohertz, <laughs> three kilohertz, I'll get used to it. At three kilohertz, the ear is most sensitive, and as you move away from three kilohertz, it's less sensitive. Okay, and this, of course, varies with age, gender, and so on, yes, and I recall reading somewhere that the best hearing is by about 22 to 25 year old females, so. How about oh. the, how about the uh, talk about urban legend, the idea that uh, above a certain frequency, uh, most adults don't hear and the teenagers like to. <laughs> what Richard is saying, there's some recent thing that what teenagers are playing music that has frequencies in it that Adults can't hear, but it annoys them. Uh -huh. I can't comment on that. I don't know. I just know most of the music. I find very dissonant. Well, no, they claim that because as you age, your your frequency response the tapers off. Oh, of course. And so that's what they're talking about. Today, is that they can speak and not be heard. Uh, oh yeah, sending messages on their phones. Yeah. It's it's an interesting urban legend. So just briefly about the transducers that are in these machines, and I'm curious now to check into the HP41 because I haven't played with that one. 
They are a piezoelectric transducer, which is basically a capacitor that's just bit banged, which means it's just sent a one or a zero at some particular rate. The acoustic output, and this is something that my study here, I learned a lot. Um, it's highly variable on how you position the calculator, how you position the recording device, you know, how that all relates to your ear. I'm not really sure, so I'm just going to show you one set of measurements, but I intend to make a lot more. And also the clock rate of the microprocessor, as you know, since that's divided down to do this bit banging, does determine. When you tell it 440, it looks like it comes out about 430, 445, depending on the calculator. <laughs> This is an interesting poster from the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. And there's a lot of information on here, but it, the nice thing about it is it shows all of the sounds that exist in nature. And this blue band in particular that you see up here is the range of human hearing. So you can see there's a lot of sounds, a lot of acoustic energy out there that we can't hear, but other animals perhaps can, and maybe cars. But that's another story. So, what I decided to do, this was part of my highly technical test setup. I used some relatively uh, non-reflective material with a, a little SD card recorder. And I put all the calculators face down because it seems most of the acoustic energy comes off of that. What I hope to do someday is do a, a three-dimensional polar plot to, to show what it's really like. But you'll see how I did all these measurements. And I did it basically at these frequencies, 440, and then 1 kilohertz all the way up to 5 kilohertz, and then just finally at 880. There's the three machines for what it's worth. I only used a 48, and these are the, well, this isn't the actual machine. These two are the actual machines I use. I have a 48 G2 and a 49 G plus. I didn't get around to a 50, but I assume it'll be very close to the 49 G plus. This shows the measurements. Some of you may recognize the sound level meter out there. That's vintage Radio Shack stuff. Cost about 40 bucks still on eBay. And there's some pros and cons it has to my more powerful sound measuring equipment, which I won't talk about here. So the first thing I did was just measure the basic sound pressure level output at different frequencies. Now, You'll hear when I do these here, I'll get them as, as equal distant as possible from the microphone. Larger SPL is louder here, so you can see clearly that the 48 is 5 to 10 dB louder than the 50 for the 48 series. Okay. But again, I found so much variability while I was doing this. I, you know, these are fuzzy measurements, but they, they give us a general trend. Hey, Thomas? Yes, sir. Um, I don't remember the source, but I remember back at the time when the 48G2 and 49 and those others came out and were quieter, HP's answer was that they had feedback from teachers asking them to make it quieter since they were being pushed into schools. So they actually oh, really? dumbed it, or uh, not dumbed it down, but toned it, toned it down? Toned it. Because they were being used in schools, mm -hmm. which... Yeah, I, I, I I don't know either way on that. I haven't taken, I've taken 48s apart, but not the other two, to see how they're actually mounted in there. I mean, who knows if they change the transducer. I don't know if Tim knows offhand. It's, it's been a while. Um, but they do all apparently seem to be that way. And I do have more units. I hope to do more testing to get some better indications here. Now, here's an example. <coughs> if you remember what that 440 hertz sine wave looks like, this should look like we go up about there, come down, and then back to here. And this is what the calculator is putting out when you tell it to put out 440 hertz. Now, nobody claims it's supposed to be a sine wave, but it does make some noise. And you could, you could do a, a spectral analysis of this and determine what frequencies are in there, but that's beyond this talk. So, I hope to measure these three machines, but instead, I just finally captured all these waveforms. And what you're seeing here, and see, I can easily flip through these so we can compare them. Uh, let's see. This is 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, and then 880, and in the middle is the 440. Now, these are not all at the same time base, so don't let it bother you that, you know, why does the 3 kilohertz look like the same time as the 440, okay? I just 
I wanted to get a, a more <coughs> graphical picture at this point. And you can see, at least for these three machines, the differences between them is quite significant. There's the G+, plus, the 49 G+, plus, there's the 48. Again, amplitude, that's not the point of looking at these waveforms. I just wanted to see the spectral content of them, just to see how, how glitchy they were, so to speak. Do you go back between the G plus and the G2? Yeah. Yeah, I, di I didn't expect to see such a difference, but again, who knows what's varying in manufacturing. Where they're mounted on the circuit board, they just can't put them anywhere. It's a big factor, right? Yes. And that's why I'm curious how these may vary as far as their what would you call their polar response. You know, there, there may be some directionality to this too. And I tried to keep that consistent in my test process. So these should be in, indicative of that. So anyhow, a lot more study needs to be done. So a couple applications I've done because my main interest or early interest was an alarm clock. So what I've done Give me just a second here, if I've got the right machine. Which it ends up I don't. Perhaps during the breakout, I think one of my other machines has this code running. What this does, it gets the hour. It does the modulo 12 because given that it's a 24-hour clock, I don't really care if it's 2300, but if it's 11 o'clock, I'd like to know that. So that's why the modulo 12 is in there. And then I have it put out 440 hertz tones for a tenth of a second. And I'll try to get my machine to get done. The minute, what I do, because you may not want to hear it beep 59 times, if it's 59 minutes past the hour, I divide it by five. So if it beeps three times, I know it's 15 past the hour. Only it beeps five times. You don't transmit it in Morse code? Yeah. <laughs> you can work on that, Richard. I, 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 didn't, I didn't get to that yet, but that's a very interesting recommendation. Um, what I can show you here briefly, let me see how I can do this so I don't move anything too much. <clears throat> through it all? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the 49. I'm going to position the 48 in the same position. Again, this is highly non-technical. This is the 49G plus again. <coughs> Give me just a second here to key in some numbers. <coughs> do these real quick so I can move on. This is, I'll do this one once more. This is the 49G plus. Nothing at all? Now here's a 48 in about the same position. It's actually a 48G uh, with a 33 era, 3300 on the serial number, which could be a variable also. Okay. Here's some code if you want this from me. This is an example of a piece of code 
that is an alarm clock. So you can put it, put this code to run in your alarm, and then at that time it'll go off, and then I think it actually shuts itself off at the very end. I'll try to demonstrate this. I brought the wrong machine up here, but I've got a machine here that has this code in it. There's a couple things. You can find these on the museum website. A big band type of tones, the Fur Elise piece by Beethoven. It sounds okay. So one thing that's intrigued me, am I really, am I out of time? Okay. Five minutes? Okay, real quick. So you've all seen this. This is an example of of chaos in our number system, but we always look at it graphically, right? These aren't what the numbers are doing, this is a graph of what the numbers are doing. So I got to thinking, well, what does this sound like? So with this particular one, since the output ranges from negative two to two, I just wanted to scale it to an audible scale, so I translated this from 440 hertz to 880. I also thought it might be fun to put it in one octave and stuff like that, but... Is that Next time. Is that an X in on the right square? Oh, thank you. Yes. I won't touch the screen, but yes, the X of N plus 1 should be squared. Thank you, Roger. See, somebody's paying attention. Okay. So, let's say, for instance, that the value of C equals negative 0.5 right here, right? There's just one value. So, if we use that, we get something that sounds like this. I can't hear. Oh. Can, is it coming through the microphone for the audience? Barely. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. It's constant, right? It's the same. It's the same. Oops, sorry, Jake. Don't step on the microphone! Oh, is that what that was? <laughs> so I'll put that mic right there. Is that better, Jake? Okay. So that's out at that value. Now, if we were somewhere down here around negative one, we should hear it jump or switch between two values. Like right on top. And there you can hear, and I've actually got it on the screen here plotting out. This is jumping between 620 hertz and 550. When we get to somewhere around what is that, about one, negative 1 1.35? We should hear it change between four different values. Oops. You're listening here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's cycling through four different values. And I think the stack just overflows. That's why it's slowed down. Well, let's get to the real fun part, I guess. Real close to negative 2, about negative 1.999. 999. So, you can yeah, see you're rocking like maybe there is. So you can fidget around with this and figure, well, I think I hear some looping, but. So, that's what that sounds like. Here's, the, here's all the code that's running in there. There's one piece of code called iteration, basically, that does that, and then the actual loop is right here. And it just runs forever, just getting out the tones. I need more measurements, more stable measurement techniques, because I found it stable as I tried to keep stuff with stuff on tripods and stuff that I repeat it and get different numbers. So I need to do some work and also investigate the variance amongst machines. Then I got, this just hit me this morning, the audibility of the Mandelbrot cell. And I thought of a few ways to do that, so maybe next time. I might need more speakers, so. So it'll have to, yeah, okay. This is from Maxell, I was gonna put it down for courtesy of them, but some of you who used to buy audio tape. That was one of their famous conversions. Okay, questions. Yes, Richard. A couple of years ago, I included on in the conference proceeding a new technology. I guess I forgot what it was called, but I'll use the term directive sound, where you have a speaker overhead and you only hear it in the yes. phone. What, what's it called? Well, it's the opposite of a cone of silence. Um, it's just directional sound. And if directional you're the, sound. If you're at the Computer History Museum, 
the displays Those there. Are the ones that they're That's using? what they're using okay. there. Yeah, I'm not sure if they contact it's a very distinctive yes. cutoff point. Yes. It's, it's an interesting signal processing but, method. But there. If you buy, say, you, I wanted to buy a set of speakers just have for demonstration purposes. Mm -hmm. They're not cheap. They're expensive. <laughs> well, what kind? Well, we can talk about it. I always shop the cheapest one available. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, back to the Apple II, there was a possibility to record sound from the um, cassette tape audio in jack. There is a pulse width modulation system. You could record your voice and replay it. And it was pretty bad quality, but you could you know, understand what was said. Yes. Do you think a similar method would allow a buzzer in a 48? You know that that's a very good. I don't. I doubt the 48 would be fast enough to do that. However, there was a piece of code for the 48G I found a long time ago. I think the person, and it was not a very popular person, it was called television or TV, and the screen looked like static on an old analog TV, but it played white noise that actually sounded quite good. And I'm still trying to find that code. If anybody finds it, let me know because it, it's on one of my machines that. I'll have to find, but yeah, and, and actually, by the way, yeah, I'd, I'd have to look into that on the 40. That's an interesting idea. So that would require to address, like, putting the further off and on? Yes, yeah, that's the only thing you can do in one of these machines, yeah. It's not an analog output, it's just a pulse digital output. The other interesting thing I mentioned, I started out this talk talking about losing words. Well, I'm glad to be here in Silicon Valley. Dr. Knuth, who Richard mentioned, is still alive and he still does lectures at Stanford. So where I live, I can walk over and listen to Dr. Knuth. And you still haven't finished your program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you're familiar with his work, yes. I, a professor I had at university introduced me to him. He was actually, it was the same professor who laughed at my HP 65. He introduced me to Dr. Knuth. I mean, on paper, anyway. Got to meet Dr. Here. Anything else? That's, that not, that <coughs> I will have the plotter running during the break. By the way, things did go wrong, but I did get it fixed. It seemed the I.O. parameter blocked for the calculator. Somebody might have picked it up during the night and was visiting with it. Oh, the mice do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.